Hello and welcome to this episode of China Edge brought to you by the SubChina team. I'm your host, Lizzie, an MIT-trained economist turned journalist here at Wall Street TV who covers China and its relation to the world. At China Edge, we go beyond the headlines and guide you, our audience, through the jungle of Chinese regulations. We go deep into industry trends and identify challenges and opportunities in the Chinese market. Beijing launched a series of military drills in the wake of Speaker Pelosi's Taiwan trip apparently sending multiple aircraft and vessels across a median line in the Taiwan Strait and firing ballistic missiles directly over Taiwan, including some which landed in Japan's exclusive incoming zone waters. Just as Tuesday, Taiwan's Foreign Minister Joseph Wu accused China of using Pelosi's visit as a pretest for military show of force and eventually evasion. Joining me today to discuss the ongoing cross-strait tensions is Professor Taylor Fravel, Professor of Political Science at MIT. Professor Fravel, thank you so much for being here with me. Thanks so much for having me. So, Professor Fravel, can you first help me understand sort of the significance of the military drills we have seen so far? How escalatory are they? Sure. I mean, these are the most significant exercises targeting the island of Taiwan since uh, the crisis in 1995 and 1996. Uh, so in that sense, uh, they're quite escalatory uh, for many different reasons. Uh, first is that uh, China uh, identified uh, six military exercise areas or closure zones in which uh, live ammunition exercises would be conducted. Uh, many of these were quite close, or parts of them were quite close to the island of Taiwan, perhaps 10 to 12 nautical miles at, at their closest points. They ringed the island of Taiwan, threatening it from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Mm -hmm. They targeted uh, Taiwan's main ports. Uh, the exercises, including uh, sorry, sorry, the exercises included uh, some unprecedented um, activities, such as launching uh, ballistic missiles uh, into a, a a military exercise area to the east of Taiwan. Right. And so some of these missiles, we don't know quite how many were launched anywhere from nine to 16, uh, landed um, or overflew the island of Taiwan, perhaps four or five, although they were in the atmosphere when this happened. Uh, nevertheless, um, it's quite a symbol to, to, be, to, to, to sort of use your hardware and, and sort of go directly across uh, the island. Um, moreover, uh, we've seen other elements that we haven't seen before. Uh, there is a median line between uh, the mainland of China and Taiwan, and this has sort of a, been a buffer zone. It's meant to kind of limit uh, the potential for accidents and miscalculations. And so historically, for the most part, with some exceptions, uh, planes from Taiwan would not go to the west of this line, and planes from China would not come to the east. And what we've seen since these exercises have started is China has completely uh, chosen to ignore the line, and there have been flights, I think, with at least 10 aircraft a day on most days um, since the 2nd of August or the 3rd of August crossing the median line. Um, and we've seen now very sort of robust uh, presence of Chinese military assets in the waters around Taiwan. And so every morning, or every, because morning my time, evening Taiwan time, the Ministry of Defense in Taiwan releases information about PLA activities. And it appears that there's roughly 10 to 14 ships in the waters around Taiwan up in the Chinese Navy, and perhaps 40 to 60 aircraft on a given day. And so that's a really significant kind of ratcheting up of the military pressure. Uh, so for all these reasons, I think um, quite escalatory and uh, in many ways unprecedented. Right. And have we seen the peak of that military show of force, or do you expect even more escalatory moves in the days to follow? So it appears for the moment, although this is in real time, it's hard to make you know, point predictions about the future, but I think the peak of the exercises was this period from the 4th of August to the 7th of August, uh, because that was when the, the live fire exercises were held in these six closure areas. And so the exercises are continuing each day now, the Eastern Theater Command uh, in, in China's PLA, which is overseeing these exercises, will make an announcement, a very brief one sentence statement about what is happening that day. So they say the exercises are continuing. Uh, yesterday was focused on, I think, anti-submarine warfare, and today it was focused on kind of joint blockade, but the, the pace seems to have decreased a bit and we've moved from kind of the live fire stage to to a, a different stage that doesn't include um, a lot live, live fire exercises, which have a much broader impact right on on commerce around the island, on access to ports, on access to the airspace and everything else. And so they seem to have sort of reduced in intensity, mm -hmm. uh, but they are continuing and there is no apparent uh, uh, end date or termination date yet uh, for these exercises. Right, and as you as you uh, as you know, China last Friday also abruptly halted cooperations with the U.S. on military relations, saying it mm -hmm. would cancel 
military phone calls, defense meetings, and would pull out of、uh, safety、mm. talks. I wonder if you can elaborate how、mm. these military-to-military -military communications channel actually work, and what are what are the、sure. dangers associated with Beijing shutting down those channels? So, I mean, the most fundamental point to take away is that in a moment like this.、Uh, Communication is more important than ever, right? And so, anything that reduces communication, I think, raises the inherent risk.、Uh, that may be the point that Beijing is trying to make,、um, but nevertheless, I think it's risky. So they canceled、uh, three different、uh, talks, and and they're a bit technical, so、I'm, just bear with me for a moment.、Uh, the first has to do with theater commander talks.、Mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear to me these have, have actually ever been held. This would be, I think, between the Eastern Theater Command. And the Indo-Pacific commander. So、um, there may have been some talks that were not announced that happened, but these were never publicly announced. So it's not clear that anything substantive here was being canceled. Though it would be good if the theater commanders spoke. They then canceled the defense policy consultative talk.、Uh, these are usually held once a year、uh, to plan、um, sort of the upcoming program of military-to-military -military interactions between the U.S. and Chinese armed forces. I believe the last in-person defense policy consultative or coordinate. Coordination talks occurred in January of 2020, right before COVID. There may have been a version of these talks last fall in a phone call that the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Mike Chase had with his counterpart.、Uh, but but these are not a crisis management mechanism, right? They're basically a mechanism by which the military sit down and talk about what kinds of exchanges to have in the coming year. And then the third is the 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 MMCA. These are the oldest. These goes back to nineteen late nineteen nineties, I believe nineteen ninety seven. And that it's the,、uh, the the I'm going to get the name slightly wrong, perhaps the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement or the other way around MMCA.、Uh, but it's meant to focus on how to manage uh, uh, the potential for accidents at sea,、uh, and it usually meets on an annual basis. And and it's sort of meant to be very working、uh, level or operational, talking about sort of the nature of of their interactions in the past year. Uh, this last met, I believe, in in December, either just in 2020 or 2021. Really, has not met this year,、um, but it's not a crisis management mechanism either. It's more of a way of kind of improving sort of trust and confidence. So,、um, they, I think they canceled them because they wanted to cancel things that that looked as if、uh, the PLA was taking a, a tough stand against the U.S. military. It's not clear that these necessarily are the most important channels of communication. So, for example, it remains unclear. If there is a still a channel between、uh, on the U.S. side, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Milley and his counterpart in China,、uh, the PLA's、uh, Chief of the Joint Staff General Li Zuochang,、um, uh, as you know,、uh, they had four talks,、uh, four phone calls in 2020,、uh, in a very sort of tumultuous time in U.S.-China relations. It's not clear to me if those are continuing or not. And there was a crisis management sort of、um, working group that was that had one meeting in the fall of 2020, and nothing that has also been. Suspended because there's no indication that it had met、um, or met in 2021, and so、uh, this is overall I think a worrying situation. Even setting aside what China has canceled, because because we we don't know what level of communications the two militaries are having. These exercises、uh, and the presence of Chinese ships are occurring in very busy parts of Northeast Asia. They're near uh, some uh, Japanese islands in, in some cases.、Uh, U.S. ships operate routinely out of Japan、uh, and are forward deployed there, and so I, I think. There's a great need for for more working level、uh, communications、uh, between the two militaries,、uh, precisely to avoid an accident or miscalculation,、uh, given the great the greater presence of vessels that could then escalate into something further. Right, and、um, so we think back to the last time there was a crisis、uh, in the Taiwan Strait,、mm. the third Taiwan Strait crisis. China's military was outmatched by that of the United States,、mm. uh, but military experts seem to generally agree that this time around the U.S. actually can't assume its military dominance in the region anymore. I wonder if you can help our audience understand the progress the PLA has undergone since the last crisis. How does the China, you know, how does China's military advancement? Change Xi Jinping's strategic calculus for Taiwan. Sure.、Uh, so let me first talk about、um, sort of the progress China has achieved in its military modernization, and then moved on to what this sort of means for cross-strait relations in Xi Jinping. I mean, China's moder military modernization is perhaps one of the most kind of wholesale and perhaps rapid peacetime military modernizations we've seen. In a very long time,、um, the PLA in in the early 1990s、uh, was a very limited force in terms of its ability to project power, especially air and naval power, anywhere beyond its shores. It had, of course, a large army and could project some power immediately on its periphery. But it but it was a pretty 
weak uh, military, uh, uh, and it had lots of outdated equipment based upon designs from the 1960s and the 1970s. Starting in the late 1990s, after uh, the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy uh, during the, the war in Kosovo um, by the United States, China began a much more rapid recapitalization of its force to the point where uh, it has almost entirely new ships, tanks, missiles. I mean, na name the weapon system or the platform. Um, now the majority of those, uh, for the most part, are going to be modern, which is they're going to be based upon uh, recent designs, recent technologies. And in some cases, such a shipbuilding is really quite impressive. At the same time, the PLA cut uh, from the late 1990s to the present, 1 million soldiers from its force. So went through a significant downsizing uh, that didn't reduce its capability. It actually made it more efficient, right? Because it, it had to spend, it was, it was able to spend less on personnel and more on equipment training and hardware. And so um, the most powerful militaries are not necessarily the largest numerically, right? That they have the greatest capability. And sometimes that requires a uh, downsizing your force. Um, China's on a trajectory to achieve uh, sort of different sort of mileposts in modernization. Uh, one was in 2020. Uh, the second is 2035, when it aspires to be basically modernized, and then 2049, when it aspires to be um, uh, fully transformed into a world-class military. And so we are in the middle of this modernization process, but it's already achieved a really significant progress. The last thing I would note here is that uh, starting in 2016, the organization of the PLA itself was completely overhauled. And so it, it had been uh, it had used this sort of general staff system inherited or based upon the Soviet model that was put in place in the 1950s. And that was completely abolished. Uh, it down, basically downgraded the role of the ground forces in the PLA um, by transforming it into a service, or sort of by creating a new army headquarters, placing it on par with the other service headquarters, whereas previously in the old system, it kind of, the army dominated the others. And so this was designed really to, um, uh, better increase the command of, uh, of Chinese forces so that they can conduct joint operations. And that's part of what we're seeing in these exercises, right? The coordination of your air, sea, um, and missile forces to achieve a, a specific military sort of mission or, or, or objective. And so China's still working through this process. It doesn't happen overnight, but but nevertheless, right? This, this is not the same PLA that we saw in the 1995-1996 Taiwan Straits crisis. Then, uh, most of the exercises uh, were based upon simulating an amphibious assault because they could draw upon their ground forces um, and didn't have much of a Navy to conduct the kinds of um, exercises they've been conducting more recently in waters very close. The Taiwan didn't have the Air Force to fly around, to, to fly uh, over open water, etc. Now, what does this mean, though? Um, on the, I think it has two different meanings. Right? On the one hand, one lesson of 1995 and 1996 is that is that if China is really worried about Taiwan, it's it is still willing to use force even if its military is backward, right? And so um, it's not the case that that Xi Jinping today is necessarily empowered by a stronger military and that's more willing uh, to take action in response uh, to Pelosi's visit and other concerns. Nevertheless. Uh, by having a much more modern and capable military, uh, 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 China can more finely calibrate uh, sort of and fine tune its military response, uh, which I think means we'll see uh, a continuation of sort of Chinese air and naval uh, presence around the island of Taiwan for the foreseeable future, even if there are no exercises uh, that are taking place. And this will be a, you know, a pretty significant change from only a few years ago. Uh, and so uh, Xi Jinping has many more options uh, up to and including invasion, but also far short of invasion. So one option would be a blockade. Uh, that's not something that PLA could have done 20 years ago. Um, certainly, it's, it's an option that they could pursue today, one that's featured, been featured prominently in, in these exercises. Uh, whether or not it would, work, it, it would work, I think, is a separate question. But but I think uh, it, it clearly is a capability uh, that China now has. And so in some ways, Xi Jinping can more finely um, calibrate or fine tune uh, the way in which uh, military force uh, can be used to achieve uh, China's uh, political objectives. Right. And as we know from past experience, it's this action reaction chain of events could easily escalate into further conflict. So at this yes. point, what steps should both sides, the United States and China, take to cool down the temperature a little bit and to you know keep a lid on the tension, so to speak? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, at the broadest level, um, both sides could do a lot to assuage the concerns of the other. Right. China has really been squeezing Taiwan ever since Taiwan was elected, um, diplomatically, economically, to some degree militarily, as we've seen uh, with these exercises, but before. And that creates a lot of pressure on the U.S. to do more for Taiwan, um, uh, given various uh, U U U.S. commitments. At the same time, 
Uh, the United States, uh, certainly from China's standpoint, appears to be uh, changing uh, the, its one China policy, or, or at least the implementation of its one China policy that I think has quite alarmed Beijing uh, for the last six months. And, and in this way, I think Pelosi's visit uh, should be viewed in the broader context of the way in which China is worried about uh, broader changes in U.S. policy. And so I think China can uh, doesn't need to squeeze Taiwan nearly as hard. Uh, it's in a very strong position, uh, regardless of how hard it squeezes. It really wants, I think, to see the DPP bend the knee, but that's unlikely to happen. Uh, and it's just going to create a, a counter response and create a greater incentives for uh, increased support from the United States. On the other hand, I think the United States, as your guest uh, Zach Cooper mentioned yesterday, right, uh, could make a much more clear and precise statement of what the one China policy is and what it is not, uh, what, what, it, what it means uh, that uh, we have unofficial relations, or the United States government has unofficial relations with Taiwan and not official relations. And this question, quite frankly, is going to come to a head in the Taiwan Policy Act that's now currently in Congress. And so I think I think that would be an important step that the United States could take. But but this is not a a crisis uh, that that the U.S. alone created. Right? We are in this uh, pretty negative uh, downward spiral, as you referenced earlier, between uh, China and the U.S. over Taiwan. So I think China can do a lot as well. Um, by 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 creating much less of a need for for increased uh, sort of external uh, support for Taiwan, uh, sort of the long term uh, trend are still arguably in China's favor, which means that it can also pursue many other non military means. You think about although I, I mean I realize it's very unlikely now after the national security law in Hong Kong. I think about uh, what might what might sort of appeal positively to the people of Taiwan rather than what might try what what would be done to sort of scare them or to coerce them and so so both sides have a lot to do here if you enjoy our discussions here i'm sure you would find value in our new powerful marketplace tool for investors also called china edge it tracks distills and analyzes both chinese language and english language materials about chinese companies business leaders and government entities and reviews the often hidden links between them for our youtube viewers we are offering a limited time 50 percent discount just go to the link you see on the screen and use the code edge 50. also sign up for the china edge newsletter it's a daily two-minute rundown of China business news you don't want to miss. The link is right here on the screen. You can also click on the link in the video's description section to get your complimentary subscription today.